Hi, Abraham. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions on um, the tapes on virtual reality. I remember you saying on the tapes, if I understood them correctly, that um, that would be a wonderful tool to help us in our manifestations. And at one point, I thought I heard you say, if you could do that even you know, 30 seconds at a time, three times a day, in 30 days, you could see a lot of what you want being allowed into your life. And it seems like that was not a lot to ask. 30 seconds, three times a day, okay, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And yet I found that I was very resistant to doing it, and I'm trying to figure out why that is or what I can change about it. I mean, it's a pleasant thing, and yet... Well, let's talk about what virtual reality is and why it serves you. Virtual reality is it's just a happy daydream. Mm -hmm. It's just a daydream that causes you to be in a state of allowing. Okay. And the reason that we think that virtual reality, which is just picking in your mind a place and a time of day and a time of year, just sort of setting the scene almost like you're a movie director doing it. The reason that we encourage this process of virtual reality is because as you begin to play with it, it's easier to go to a dream that's pure than to take a current situation and turn it into something that is pure. It's easier to dream happiness than it is to imagine somebody you live in cleaning up their room. It's easier to, to dream abundance than to imagine getting out of debt. And so it's just an easier place to start. And because law of attraction is what it is, law of attraction and source and all that is that is responding to your vibration does not care how you got to that point of vibration. In other words, you could be remembering it or imagining it or observing it, but sometimes it's easier just to make it up. Right. So you say, well, I get all of that. I want to make it up. I even believe in the process and have even seen some value from it. So why don't I do it more? And we say, well, it might be that you've trained yourself to believe that good things should be longer in coming or that good things should be harder work or that it takes pain to have gain. In other words, you might have some dominant beliefs that you've been practicing for a while that you have to deactivate. But this is the thing that we most want you to hear. Whatever you've been activating is going to call you for a while. But as you deliberately activate other things in time, those other things will start calling you. In other words, it is much easier for you to relax back into the natural vibration of well-being than it has been for you to gradually talk yourself out of the vibration of well-being. And that's the place you've come to where you are finally deciding, all right, I've decided that I'm going to run my own show for a while. I've decided that I am going to be the creator of my own reality. I'm going to try to guide myself from the inside out. So then we say, all right, then we suggest that you get in touch with who is on the inside. And you say, well, how do I go about that? And we say, well, we would stop thoughts of a physical nature, if you really want to know. We'd try to quiet our mind. We would meditate and stop thought. And when you quiet your mind, watch what happens. So people set out to discover who's in there. And as they quiet their mind, which means they stop all thought, which means they stop resistant thought, they begin to feel lighter. They begin to feel better. Headaches begin to go away. They begin to laugh more. Their life begins to take on more of an aura of well-being all around. And the reason for that is, in that little bit of practice of non-thought, they have begun to practice the releasing of trained-in resistance. And it doesn't take very much of that before you gravitate back to your natural state of well-being. Mm -hmm. Now, we might ask you the same question, or any of you. Even though meditation is a proven method, even proven to you by most of you, to release resistance, do you do it on a rather regular basis? And many will say, no, I wait until I get into a bind to do it. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of tools that I use, but I don't use them on a regular basis. I use them just when I get into a place of stronger resistance. And we say, so hear what you're saying. I practice my normal resistance, and then I practice the releasing of resistance when it's really necessary. Well, that's a pretty good statement when you think about it, because that, what that's saying is, even though I've learned quite a bit of resistance along my physical trail, still I mostly thrive. We think it would be pretty cool. 
if when you thought a negative thought, the ro a roof tile would just fall on your head. <laughs> or when, when you think a negative thought, a tooth would just fall out. <laughs> we think you'd be more diligent. <laughs> but when it's something as insignificant as just momentary negative emotion that you can adjust to, that you can get used to, then many of you say, hmm, this resistance is I'm not really thriving, but it's not killing me either. And so we just think you have to make a decision that it is important to feel good. Right. And many of you are coming to that. Sometimes you make your strongest decision of how important it is to feel good when you feel at your very worst, you feel your very baddest. And we say, oh, well, talk about doing something the hard way, making a decision to feel good when you're feeling your very worst. That's like saying, I think I will dig a hole a mile deep and then I will climb out and then I will get on my journey. And we say, why not just get on your journey? And you say, oh, well, there's something more virtuous about digging the hole first, don't you think? And mm -hmm. you say, the public seems to like it more. When I overcome strong obstacles, I get more applause and so, <laughs> and more attention. And it's annoying to disconnected people when I'm tuned in, tapped in, turned on all the time. So uh, I have to be a little human. And we say, oh, we would give all of that up. We would give up every bit of resistance that we could in every moment. In our moments, we would be looking for reasons to feel good. And if virtual reality works for you, then do it. If having something funny in your pocket to read all the time works for you, then do it. If listening to beautiful music does it for you, then we would do it. In other words, we would do everything. And what you begin to notice is a lot of variety pleases you. There are so many things that get you into that high good feeling place. And then... Once you have sort of mastered the feeling good whenever you want to, then you can apply it to any subject that you want. Yes. yes. Okay, so it's a mental discipline to go and do these things. Like, if I want to do the... There's a commitment in the beginning if there, I have some resistance based on my past of yes. not taking the 30 seconds yes. to do that. It's interesting how we talk about how much discipline we need to feel good. <laughs> yeah. I'm working really, 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 really hard at feeling good because, because I know there's a good reason, because, because. That's like someone giving you an ice cream cone, your favorite kind, everything about it delicious, and they say, now try to enjoy this. You say, I'll work on it, but it's not my nature to like my favorite ice cream cone. Right. It's like being in the middle of a sensuous sexual experience and having someone ring in and say, try to have a good time. <laughs> try, try to have a good time there. <laughs> you think, <laughs> there are some things that just come natural, aren't there? Right. Yes. And feeling good comes so natural, you say. Right. It is so weird to not feel good and it is so natural to feel good. Yes. Yes, thanks. When you were making the analogy um, well, earlier, you were saying you don't know the next hundred movies you're going to see in your life, but they can be good. Can you apply that to men as well? Because, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let me clarify that, but whether it's, whether it's myself or the clients I work with, I'm a therapist, there's so much angst when the right partner, the quote right man, the one, has not come. I was thinking, you know, if we didn't have the attachment to what, there's an attachment around, well, he's got to be the partner, the lifetime partner. The, But if we took it like the movies, it really wouldn't have to be like that, would it? Because whatever would be in front of you would be your, your now experience. As most people, not all, but most people approach the idea of relationship, they are unfulfilled, looking for a missing piece to fulfill them. Yes. So the whole time that piece is missing, they are unfulfilled, which yes. means they cannot find the piece because it's missing. You have to be in the place of allowing the well-being to flow before it can come, you mm -hmm. see. And that's why so many relationships feel a little void for a while, but if you are in the habit of finding voids to fill, then every relationship, the good part of it is temporary because you're always reaching then for something else to fill the new void that comes. This isn't a subject of relationships. This isn't a subject of money. This isn't a subject of filling the laundry list. This is a subject of getting into the place of feeling good for no good reason other than it's natural 
so that all things that I have defined in this physical format and beyond can be fulfilled, revealed to me now. We don't know how you can easily say to someone who is all upset about someone missing in their life because as long as they feel that upsetness, they can't let in what they really want. So we do what mothers of small children do. We try to distract them from what's really bothering them. Because if they are not activating the sense of loss or loneliness, then their desire can be fulfilled. And so then we would talk to them like this as they say, oh, it's been so long. We would say, those words aren't getting you anywhere. And they would say, but they are true. Shouldn't I tell you like it is? And we say, only if you want more of what is. And they would say, well, I don't want more of what is. I don't want more absence of my mate. And so we say, well, then let's talk about something else. And they say, well, I don't really want to talk about anything else because this is the thing that matters the most to me. And we say, all right, then let's talk about what you really want. And they say, well, what I really want is something that I don't have. And we say, well, we shouldn't talk about what what you have, we should talk about what you want. And they say, well, it's so painful to talk about what I want because it just reminds me of what I don't have. And we say, you are in this place where you cannot win. You're saying, I want this thing I do not have and do not have and do not have and do not have. Did I mention to you that I do not have this thing I want? I do not have this thing I want. And we say, well, how do you feel? And they say, I'm miserable because I do not have this thing I want. And we say, well, that will not get you to this thing you want. And they say, I know, can you please help me? <laughs> and we say, yes, we can help you, but you've got to talk about what you do want. And they say, I can't talk about what I do want because when I talk about what I do want, it reminds me that I don't have what I do want. And we say, well, is there anything? Is there anything working in your life? And they say, yes. <laughs> Yes. We say, would you like to talk about it? And they say, no, I need to talk with you about the things that are not working. And we say, therein lies your problem. When you talk constantly about the things that are not working, you do not amplify or escalate what does work. In every powerful now, you're escalating what works or you're escalating that what doesn't work. And everything is tied together. So if you can find one little piece of something in your life that works, and talk about it, praise it, bask over it, pat yourself on the back, tell others about it, feel good about it, feel smug about it, feel happy about it. What happens is you hold yourself in a state of perpetual allowing of good things. And then other things on other topics are allowed because of your holding yourself in this holding pattern of well-being relative to one thing. I've experienced that, actually. Yes. My career started taking off when I got my attention off my career, when I was in a relationship. And relationships will take off when you get your attention off the relationship that isn't there. Sometimes you're at the place where you can start thinking about the relationship, and thinking about the relationship is life-giving. It's delicious. It's lovely. It gives you goosebumps. And so under those conditions, don't think about something else. Think about that. But use the wisdom that comes with your emotions to know whether the thought that you're thinking is allowed what you want or whether it's disallowing you can tell it's not hard to tell good feels good and resisting good does not feel good you can always tell okay. and if you're not sure just keep doing whatever you're doing and pretty soon you'll be able to tell <laughs> right. It'll because get whatever direction you're going is going to become more and more and more right. we think that sometimes what happens is that you are most of you are not using your power of focus. And part of that is because of the diversity of your life, because of the fast moving of your life, because of the variety of your life. And so you cannot actually stay on one subject only for a long period of time. But if you will pick a subject that pleases you and use it to really make yourself feel good as much as you can, you'll begin to feel the momentum of all of that. When you achieve a certain vibrational level relative to one subject, that's the vibration that's activated within you, which means every subject that's going to come to you has to meet you at that level. Okay. So it is not possible to feel lucky in love without enhancing your financial fortune as well, unless you keep beating the drum of the financial problems, you see. Mm -hmm. So getting a little happy about one thing serves you in a lot of things, just like getting a little unhappy about one thing is detrimental relative to a lot of things. So let's not make it complicated. Let's just say, find something to get happy about and focus on it. Focus on it. Okay. Focus on it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, indeed.